We're good. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. And uh, my name is Nancy Howell. I'm on the board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And uh, there probably will be a few other folks coming in this evening. But in the meantime, I've got uh, a few announcements that I'd like to make. Um, for those on Zoom, sorry, you can't get any apples, but we do have some apples that somebody brought in that they could take home. And at the back of the uh, room is our display table. And there's a few books uh, that you can take the, if you want to leave a dollar donation in the little in the little uh, container back there, that would be lovely. So uh, just go ahead and pick them up. There's there's like four books back there. All righty, um, thanks, Michelle. Let's let's go on to the next slide. All righty, welcome, and hopefully everyone's fall is is doing well. Um, we like people to sign up for the e-newsletter. That's one will be one of our slides coming up. We want you to become a member of, as always, and that information is in our newsletter in the back. Uh, we like people to sign up and volunteer with us as well. And I'm going to be passing around a a clipboard with lots and lots of volunteer opportunities, and as well as the Christmas bird count. So next, please. All right, so again, we're, we're re really excited to do these in-person meetings because remember with COVID, we were doing Zoom exclusively. And so we're excited about being here at the library. Um, we do like to start right at, at seven o'clock only because we are a little constrained with time here at the, at the library. Um, like I say, volunteers are needed for a variety of tasks, and I'm going to step out of the camera range <laughs> and grab our volunteer sign-up sheet. So this is going to go around, and there are many, many sheets here. There's even a pen attached. So if you're interested in any of these, look at the heading category at the top and see if you might uh, have an interest. Some of them are writing for our newsletter and website, uh, writing the, not necessarily a story, but maybe a, a, a book review or maybe a quiz, something like that. You, you, whatever, whatever your heart desires. Um, we have people that would we would where we would like to have our education committee revise, uh, revitalized, as well as our uh, native plant committee. So there's a number of things there. So please do take a look at that. All right, next. As I mentioned, please keep informed. We send an e-newsletter out once a week um, and it, it just updates everybody and, and also reminds everybody of some of the things that we have happening uh, with Western Cuyahoga Audubon field trips and uh, our, of course our, our programming. Uh, it is through MailChimp. And should you decide to, and I don't want to get these once a week, you can unsubscribe at any time. So just to let people know that. And of course, like I say, become a member. That information is in our newsletter that you can pick up at the back of the room. Next. Wow, look at that. Look at winter. Look at that, 2017. Isn't that awesome? Um, and they're pointing right to Christmas bird count 2023. Christmas bird count is going to take place on Saturday, December 30th. How many of you have participated in the Christmas bird count before? I know there's a few folks. Good. All right. For those who have not, I'm just going to do a real quick overview. Uh, the next newsletter that will come out has more information, uh, plus our one of our meetings coming up will have more information as well. We have a, a count circle, it's called the Lakewood Circle. Basically it extends all the way from Lake Erie to uh, Avon Lake, uh, North Ridgeville, down to about where the, the turnpike crosses through Olmstead Falls and Strongsville and goes to about Brooklyn, Parma Heights, that area. Uh, we have areas that we like people to cover. Uh, it could be your neighborhood. Any green space, a cemetery or a park, we have driving routes, we have walking routes, and basically you're out as long as you can be out in the morning or afternoon or both, um, counting birds, the species, as well as the number of birds. So um, if you like to participate in the Christmas bird count, oh, 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 and you can also watch birds at your feeder. 
as long as you live within our count circle area. So I just wanted to make sure we're clear on that. And I also have to come out of the camera range because I have another clipboard <laughs> that I'm going to send around with, if you'd like to participate in the Christmas bird count, please. All right, next. All right, Michelle. That's me. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be covering our upcoming bird walks and how you can connect with us on social media. All right. So we have every second Saturday of the month, we have the second Saturday bird walk at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet at 9 a.m. Uh, between the upper and lower parking lots. Just look for a group of people with binoculars. Um, and that is led by Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Al Rand, and Ken Gober. Um, I think that's it. Well, the next one is coming up. It's this Saturday, October 14th. So is that this Saturday? Okay, it's next Saturday. It is. That's right. It's only the third. Okay. All right. So the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walk, um, that is the fourth Saturday of every month, not necessarily the last Saturday. So always the fourth. And that is also at 9 a.m. We meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of the former Sokolowski's University Inn. Um, so hope to see you there. Our next one is October 28th. And then finally, we are on Facebook. We're on X, which was formerly Twitter. Um, Instagram and YouTube. We're recording uh, this presentation tonight, which will appear on YouTube. We're recording all of them throughout um, the series. So if you ever miss one, uh, you can, you know, subscribe to our channel on YouTube and you can get notified when we put them up. All right, that's it for me. All righty, Drina. Hi, everybody. My name is Drina Nemes and I'm the chairperson for the book club. And we are just about ready to start our fourth season two weeks from tonight, October 17th. Next slide, please. And that book that we're going to be discussing is called The Glitter in the Green by John Dunn. And it is all about hummingbirds. And new to me was that hummingbirds are only in the Americas. And he takes us from um, Alaska, where there are hummingbirds, all the way down to Argentina. And it's it's a fascinating look at hummingbirds and many other topics too. Um, and then in January, we'll be discussing Vesper Flights by Helen McDonald. And then in April, Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Samard. Next slide, please. If you'd like a little introduction to Glitter in the Green, uh, if you go to YouTube and just type in John Dunn, uh, Glitter in the Green, uh, there are a few, there aren't too many videos that will pop up, but he does a beautiful introduction in a really short video. It's less than two minutes, but it's a very creative uh, with lots of beautiful technical aspects to it. And then I'm just passing along something that I found, and maybe some of you know, Cornell's uh, Laboratory of Ornithology, their bird academy. Oh my gosh, the hummingbird lessons is... Uh, they just uh, started offering it, I think, this summer. It is a fantastic, fantastic program. Um, it is $60, but every so often they do offer it at $20 off. And then it's good for forever. You can keep it forever. You can do the programs over and over and over again. And, and the uh, photographs are so beautiful. Um, I did find Glitter in the Green at both the Cuyahoga and the Cleveland Public Libraries. I, I had requested the ebook from the Cuyahoga and I never, ever got it. So I'm not sure where it is. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, our good friend, David Lindo, good friend of the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. He has a, a wonderful series of Zoom interviews, very wonderfully done interview. He calls them in conservation with, and he has wonderful conversations, including one with John Dunn in his book. He also has another conversation with John Dunn about orchids, which John Dunn also did another book about. So you can find those interviews on David Lindo's Urban Birder website. Next slide, please. 
And then I like to talk about um, the environment of the mirror because they, they have a very good book club once a month. They feature the author, the author's there. Coming up um, October 26th, thir Thursday, October 26th at 8 p.m., A Wing and a Prayer, The Race to Save Our Vanishing Birds. And uh, they're very well done. And then if you're familiar or if you're not familiar with this organization, it's very big on environmental issues and also on migration. So coming up the day of the uh, Audubon, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Bird Walk, the 14th, that is International World Migratory Day. So, okie doke, thank you very much. Thanks. And I'm going to put a plug in. I did read um, uh, A Wing and a Prayer. At first, I thought, oh, gosh, a book that's going to be sad and depressed. It was really good. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book review, and I don't know if it's going to get in the next newsletter, but it's very, very well done. So just a, a small plug there. All right. Is Marianne going to be able to... Zoom, so. Not on Zoom. Yeah. All righty, very good. So let's roll her slides. All right, Marianne Romito is our Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio, which encompasses more than just Cuyahoga County, all the way from the Pennsylvania border to Lorain County, down south to Summit and Stark. Um, anyhow, Climate Watch, uh, two times a year, winter and summer, um, people go out at a particular area, um, and there are blocks that Marianne can assign to you, and you do a bird survey. You hit 12 points, and you stay there for, I think it's five minutes, and you do that uh, at a certain date uh, that we would like to have you do it. Um, let's flip to uh, the next slide, please. And basically what it's about is long-term, how is, how is climate change affecting bird species? There's a number of birds, of course, that require certain foods, certain plants, certain temperatures. And as things warm up, will those plants be there? How is the habitat changing? How are how is our water warming up? I mean, I think a lot of you already know that Lake Erie has not been freezing a whole lot over the past few winters. So, you know, how is this going to change our, our bird uh, birds in the area? So this is what this is all about. It's it's doing a, a little bit of research. It, this data goes into uh, National Audubon as well as Cornell. Let's uh, flip to the next slide, please. So if you'd like to participate in Climate Watch, again, the, win the dates for Winter Climate Watch are January 15th through February 15th. I mean, we do have a span there, but we like to get things done quickly. So Saturday, January 20th, if you're able to participate that day, boom, one and done, we will get it all, all those points uh, done that day. But if you can't make it that day, you can see there's quite a range there. So please contact Marianne. She would love to get additional people uh, doing Climate Watch. And you do, your route is usually st you stop, take your car, go to another spot because it's in a pretty good sized block. All right, and so you can see where you can reach Marianne, uh, can jot that down, or if you have your phone, take a picture of the slide. All right, next. All right, Amanda. Yeah, please. Hello, I'm Amanda Skorowski. I'm the coordinator for the coffee committee. Um, we sell the Smithsonian Certified Bird Friendly Coffee, which means it's organic, it's shade grown, and it's fair trade. So the farmers get a living wage and we don't clear cut the, the rainforest. So by being shade grown also, there's habitat for the birds. So coffee's a little bit more expensive, but it's very well worth it. Uh, the next order goes in the 10th of this month. So you have a little bit of time to get your order in. The next order will go in January 10th. So if you need coffee between now and then, you got to order it now. I deliver it and I'll when it comes in, I will just call you and we'll set up a time to pick it up or for me to bring it to you. So anything I forgot? I think that's good. Good. I did, oh. did want to mention that we do have 
the coffee club uh, little cards at the back table. So you can pick a couple of those up or one or a lot. Pass them around. We got a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Coming up in November, uh, the, the library will be closed for visitors. It's open for polling, for the for voting. So our November meeting will be uh, via Zoom, all Zoom, all the time. And, but we're having information about wild turkeys, wild turkey management and monitoring in Ohio. Uh, Mark Wiley from ODNR will be speaking about how you as a citizen can participate in uh, the wild turkey poult count. Poult is a baby wild turkey. And so if you have turkeys in your neighborhood um, and they have young and you can get information as to how you can turn in that data, uh, how many baby turkeys are there, or maybe when they come through your yard the next time, there's fewer of them or more, you just never know. So again, just please, please be aware that the, the library will be closed and this is going to be a total, total Zoom. So we hope that you can Zoom in uh, on that Tuesday, November 7th. Next. Ah, what we've been waiting for. Um, our speaker this evening, Tom Baldwin, master bird carver and carving instructor, speaking about the bird within. And we have some of his beautiful, beautiful work here that he was going to be speaking about. Next, please. I have a little bit of information. Um, so Tom has been employed as a, an artist for most of his life, uh, took up carving, um, when he saw uh, carvings at, in Chincoteague, well, he had been on a vacation, and I guess it, it really just captivated him. So he's a contributing writer for Wildfowl Carving Magazine and has a book out for beginning carvers. Um, I had to take off a lot of the awards that Tom had listed, otherwise it would be slide after slide after slide, but Tom has gotten many, many awards and maybe he'll chat about them in a little bit, um, but he also is a juror uh, at local art shows. Um, he, he teaches uh, carving classes at uh, the Cuyahoga Valley Arts Center in Cuyahoga Falls, and he lives with his wife and two dogs in Cuyahoga in Akron, Ohio. So without any further ado, let's welcome Mr. Tom Baldwin. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate it. Uh, hey, thanks for asking me out here tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I put together this PowerPoint thing to help me walk through this thing, but I'm not real good at PowerPoint, so there might be some glitches here and there. We'll 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 wander through the best that we can. Uh, I'm not used to this thing either, but I'll I'll make my best with it. Uh, on the table here are just a few pieces I pulled out of my gallery of my studio in downtown Akron, just for the purpose of uh, showing you some of the work physically. You'll be seeing pictures, of course. Uh, up here on my left, uh, this is the current class I'm teaching at the Cuyahoga Valley Arts Center right now. We're doing a tree swallow. And uh, Nancy is one of my students this time around for this particular class. She's doing very well. But I thought I'd bring these along. You can see the pattern is here, uh, the, the birds at their process where they're at right now, how long, we, how far along we've gone. Here's some finished ones I show the class. And then just some of the tools sitting here. I also have a brochure with pictures and a little information about myself. It's a little bit more infor informed than a business card. But please take one. I have plenty of them and I know who I am. So you may help yourself. Um, and uh, that's pretty much what we have here. You're certainly welcome up here uh, after the presentation. Gladly, I'll answer questions, whatever you want to do. So, uh, the lights, does your camera work in the dark? We're sharing the screen, so I think. Oh, so I'm off film. Well, you're. You're in the little corner. <laughs> so. That's good. I, yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Whoa. Okay. Uh, that looks like a shorebird. 
Yeah. We call this the bird within because most people ask this question, you know, how, what is this about carving? Well, we start with a block of wood, literally. Uh, and most of the time we do cut the block out in a bandsaw to get a rough bird shape for the particular uh, bird that we're working on. But there is a bird within kind of a thing. It's just, you got to find the bird inside that block of wood. Uh, I practice what is known in the bird carving industry as decorative carving. Uh, which basically it doesn't mean we add lights and tinsel to it. It means that we try to carve the bird as realistically as possible. The competitions that I enter require that we try to, you know, emulate the real bird as closely as possible to take this block of wood and basically give it a glint in its eye and a little bit of life and some color. And so people looking at it can say, ah, that's a chickadee. Uh, so that is practice. So let's go ahead and uh, let's let's start up the show. It started with this. Anybody remember these things? This is the Bachman kits. When I was five or six years old and I had to do chores around the house, I saved my change, ran down to the model store every week and bought all these different birds. There were, I don't know how many there were, I'm sure I bought them all, probably more than once. And I would build them, I would paint them, and I'd stick them out in the yard and show up. Now, the Blue Jays did really well. Blue Jays are very social, and they seem to follow up on the idea of, of uh, you know, a decoy Blue Jay, which at the time, I had no idea that the process had a name. I was just doing it to see if I could bring in real birds. My favorite was the painted bunting. But my biggest disappointment was none of them showed up. <laughs> when you live in basically the southeastern corner of Medina County, Ohio, Chances of finding a painted button bunting are pretty slim. But when you're six years old, you don't know this. Anyhow, uh, this is kind of where my bird fascination started, really. I mean, I always liked them. So uh, let's go to the next one. Next one again. There's some blanks in there. I don't know why. So this is why I'm in this business. My daughter at the time in 1985 was nine, and she had read this book. And she liked the book, and that was good, until she found out that Assateague Refuge and Syncoteague Island were real and not fictional, and Misty was a real horse, and that there are horses there. Well, I never heard the end of it. It was, we got to go, Dad. We got to go. I want to see the horse. Let's go, Dad. When are we going to go, Dad? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I had my own sign business at the time, so I closed it down for a week, loaded up the kids. They'd never seen the ocean before. I thought, this can't be a bad trip, so let's go. So we went, and they saw the horses. What I saw was, of course, the Aztec Refuge. If nobody's been there, you should go. It's wonderful. Uh, but off on top of that, getting to the refuge, you pass lots of small houses on this island. Chicotec is a community that's deep, deeply uh, engrossed in the decoy history of this country. Most people do not realize that decoys is an indigenous American art form. Our ancestors did not bring this from Europe. They learned about decoying from the Native, Native Americans that were here. They didn't really carve them out of wood. They used reeds and grasses and even old skins and so forth, creating what we call a confidence decoy situation where it looks safe to the birds, but there's always hunters hiding in the bushes with their weapons. In Europe, they used more of a netting system with food at the end, kind of shaped like a horn of plenty. It was wide at the beginning, got narrower and narrower. They just wait at the end and, you know, take the take the birds out when they got in there. Our ancestors were woodworkers, shipbuilders, furniture makers. They figured out real quick, you don't have to make just confidence decoys. You can make them out of wood and they'll float. So the whole decoy history thing in this country was at its strongest on the East Coast because of the major flyway, of course. We've all read stories about the migrations in the old days where the sky was black. There was so many birds in them, something most of us have never seen. Uh, so anyway, it's an American art form. I'm seeing all these little houses with little tables out front with just like you see here, just a variety of different birds. To me, at that point, I'd seen decoys before. They're just, you know, the smooth duck thing, and they're okay. But I started seeing owls and hawks and songbirds and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, well, this is interesting. So I took a look. And I was, as Nancy mentioned, in Uh The detail really fascinated me. And I wanted to be 
better informed about what I was looking at. So the wife and the kids went to the beach, went to the horses. I hit the streets and found artists working in their studios, in their little shacks in the back. And I spent four days listening to more tall stories and legends and lore and different things. Let's go ahead to the next picture. This is the type of work that we saw in Chincoteague. Um, decoys like this. Go ahead, another one. Um, the island is, you know, literally famous for providing a lot of wonderful artists who did a lot of this decoy work back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. This next, please. That is uh, Cigar Daisy. Uh, people, that's a nickname for him. He doesn't like cigar. He goes by Cigar. Cigar Daisy. He is a local. Lived on that island all his life. Very colorful character, but a very talented. Uh, let's go ahead. And next slide. This is typical of his work. Uh, very nice work. And one more. So these are the types of, of uh, bird carvings that he did. And the shorebird shows the beginning of the decorative movement. This is when we start getting in little details for the tail, and the beak gets a little more tightened in, the painting gets a little tighter. We're getting more and more to the point where it's not just representing a bird in general, it's rep representing a bird particularly. Okay, next. This is the first carving I ever did. While I was talking with these artists on the island, one of them gave me a block of wood, a basswood. Another gave me an old knife he didn't like anymore. And I know why I didn't like it either. Uh, and a, a few patterns and a lot of encouragement. I really didn't know anything about it. And I decided I wanted to do this. And I went back home and started working on it. In those days, there was no computer. There was no online courses. There was no YouTube. Occasionally, you find a book that might kind of cover what you're talking about, but not always. Sometimes you'd find somebody, they might tell you something. You might go to a show and hear a couple of things. So it took me nine months to make this guy. Because uh, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I only had a 110 X-Acto knife and some kind of weird little goofy Dremel system and just would work at it. I'd get frustrated. I'd put it down. It would call me back. I'd keep working on it. So finally, after about nine months of what I would call something of a tug-of-war experience, it was done. And I put it on this little mount that I had. And I, for the first time, really sat back and took a look at what I had accomplished. Because so I really, when you're working on it, you just kind of like, trying to get to the next place, the next place, the next place. Well, the next place here was done. So I looked at it and I can tell you that I literally had an artistic epiphany. You know, all people who are creative, whether they're musicians, dancers, actors, artists, whatever, there's always a favorite area. I know musicians who love rock, others that love classical and so forth. I've been involved in all kinds of art all my life. But this one really hit me hard. I really, after looking at this, it, it was literally like the skies opened up, the beams came out of the sky. The only thing missing was an Elmer Bernstein soundtrack. It was literally an epiphany that I really felt, and seriously, I'm not being silly, I really felt this is what I meant to do as an artist. This is what I should be doing. And I've never looked back since. Uh, I've always been focused on this area forevermore and still main so. Uh, next, please. So this is a castrol. This is one of the earlier pieces that I was able to do once I learned a little bit more about what I'm doing and had some of the better tools to do it with. So things were getting a little easier, but still a lot to learn. Next, please. Uh, that turned out to be a life-size red tail hawk, about 22 and a half inches tall. Uh, he took six months of my life to do. It was the biggest project at that point that I'd ever accomplished. And I was real happy with the finals on that. Uh, he lives in Baltimore now. Uh, somebody purchased him and he lives in Baltimore. Next, please. Uh, this is a Cardinal that lives in Seattle. As we all know, there are no Cardinals in Seattle. I suspect the people that own it probably were from this area and missed their Cardinals. So uh, he's sitting um, in a uh, red, uh, not, the red, not red pole. Uh, what's red butt? Thank you. Thank you. As I get older, these things fleet. Um, yeah. So someone was asking earlier about competitions and so forth. So when we look at these two pieces, these were both pieces that were made for competition. The rules of the competition are pretty simple. 
The bird must be made of wood, uh, has to be highly detailed like the bird. We're allowed to use glass eyes, but the habitat or the stuff that the bird is mounted onto has to be made by the artist. So obviously the telephone pole I made that, even the uh, insulator is, is a mold that I made and poured it out of uh, polyurethane. I made my own uh, glass insulator. And actually I had a real one I put on it. And the funny object of lesson here was the real insulator made the bird look fake. But the fake isolator made the book, bird look real. So uh, I'll never be able to figure that out. So uh, on the red bud here, the leaves are made out of copper, which we can heat and texture with a, a stylus with a long ball on the end of it. Uh, the seed pods are made out of wire and tissue paper. Branches are usually made out of brass tubing that are soldered, or in later years, I learned how to weld with bronze. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a hawk owl. This is one of my, my winners. This one went to Canada and won the uh, MT uh, contest up there. It was sponsored by a Canadian business. And uh, I didn't keep him long. He went up there and won the show. And of course, it's a purchase prize. So he never came home. I'm assuming he, he's doing fine. I haven't heard from him in a while. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, this is another piece I did for competition. It had a pretty good, it didn't do any best of shows, but it got some first and second places. Uh, this is a bobolink. I happen to have one up here as well. I happen to like the bobolinks. I think they're really, really interesting. I enjoyed watching them over in Medina County at the Allerdale Park many years ago. I don't know if they're there now or not, but they used to be. Next, please. Anyone want, anyone know what that is? Anyone have this at their feeder re recently? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. This is a Costa Rica bird. So this is uh, it's an oscillated ant bird. Every once in a while, we get challenged. To, I was challenged by another artist to do something from the more exotic bird areas like Costa Rica. So that's the one I picked. It was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed the habitat, the rocks. I made the rocks, the leaves, everything. You know, it was just a lot of fun. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a female kestrel. Um, again, everything you see it mounted on was made, uh, the, the thorn branches, uh, everything. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed the, I think about making another one of those. I really like the coloring on the female kestrel. I like the male as well, but I like this even better. I thought it was a, a it was a fun project. Next. Okay. Swainson thrush. It's funny how things happen. I wanted to do one. It was it was a required bird for a particular competition on the West Coast. So I did it, although I'd never really seen a real one, but I had lots of pictures. And as soon as I finished it and painted it and was all done, one flew in my backyard and sat at my feeder for the afternoon. <laughs> so I looked at my bird and it real quick to make sure I didn't do something wrong. It seemed to be pretty reasonable. Next, uh, you know, chipping sparrow. Um, I did this up in Canada with a class with another world-class carver who was teaching it. I was really more interested in learning more about his teaching style because at that time in my life, I was thinking about doing my own teaching. And this is an artist I had huge respect for. His name was Bruce Lepper. Uh, unfortunately, we lost him last year, um, which is a, a painful reminder of surviving. That's what you have to put up with sometimes is you lose your friends. But he was a wonderful artist and a really good teacher. And I picked up some good uh, good habits from him. Please, next. There's Mr. Screech Owl, gray phase. He was in Michigan now, I think. He had a pretty good run. Uh, got some ribbons here and there. Next. Uh, this is a wood thrush in full throated song. I encountered an article written back in the 20s from a book that indicated this bird had the ability to sing two notes at once. Uh, it's not the only bird that can do that, but, he, but they can do that. And of course, uh, I lived in a place once where the wood thrush every evening, as the sun would go down, would sing through the valley and I could hear it on my backyard on my deck. And I'd rush home just to hear it because it's very flute-like and almost like a forest symphony in a way. I just really loved it. So this is a wood thrush, not screaming for his life, but just singing for it. Next. 
There's Mr. Mayo Kestrel. This is an idea I got driving down in the Amish country. I actually saw Kestrel sitting on an old rusty piece of farm equipment, using it for his perch to watch over the fields. He's looking for large bugs or small mice or whatever. And I thought, what a neat idea. So I actually did some photographs and measuring of somebody who had all these different rusty farm equipment things in their backyard and, and came up with this, which is actually the corner of a thrashing machine. Uh, the only artistic license I had is the handle and that's really more like three feet long. And that's more like half that, more like 18. But that would put the bird or the subject of the art too far away from the rest of the base. And I like this in particular because there is no base. Uh, the habitat is the base. So I kind of eliminate uh, the necessity of a block or something to hold everything up because we still have gravity to deal with. We still have to suspend these things somehow. So I always like that for that for that purpose. And this is one of the pieces I started when I took my, my uh, absence from the carbon industry for a few years. This is one of the first things I did when I came back. Next. This is more of an interpretive piece. It's all natural wood. There's no coloring involved. This is a little more of the spirit of something versus the actuality. So this is not a decorative. This is more like modern art. Uh, that is a red-billed oxpecker. Of course, they're African, and they spend most of their time on the side of animals like this, giraffes, zebras, and so forth, eating the mites out of their skin, uh, creating a, a symbiosis that these two animals enjoy each other for the various reasons. And that was made out of a piece of maple that some my neighbor cut down. And I was walking the dog one night, saw the wood, and uh, it was really heavy, big, big thing around. And I just rolled it down the street like a snowman and rolled it in my garage and let it dry for about four years before I tackled it. Uh, it was a lot of hard work. Hard wood is hard to work with. But I'm real happy with the, the final results. And uh, he decorates my living room right now. Next. Another screech owl. Um, over the years, I've always been artistically challenged with the idea of why carvings can't have more to their, to their narrative than just whatever you see in front of them on the table. I know it's a sculpture. I know it's three-dimensional. Uh, but it's, it's sometimes fun. The painters have the advantage, like when nature painters do their paintings, you get, to, you get the whole vision of what they're thinking about. So this was some, one of my attempts. This is what I call a reverse shadow box. The bird is way much in front of the artwork. The artwork is behind it. It's not in a frame. It stands uh, freeform. I'll have some other examples of that later. This was not bad, but I still felt that the artwork and the birds conflicted with each other visually. So I've been last 30 years been looking for a solution. I'll show you later what I think is a working solution. Next. Uh, that's a crow that I did for an art show in Hudson. Uh, another one never came home. He went to the show and was purchased, and I never saw him again. I'm told he's doing very well. Next. Uh, this is a miniature. That's that's a large picture of, uh, of a house finch, but actually he's not much bigger than about, uh, what is he, about, about three inches from tail to beak. So it's what we call a miniature. He's on a rusty bucket. That's made out of wood as well. Uh, even the lettering, I do that. I, well, I used to be a sign painter, so this is not a big surprise for me to do that. Uh, that one did pretty well at shows too, I think. Uh, that one my wife likes, so it's at home. I was told not to sell this one. Next. Okay, here's Superstar. In 2017, I did this piece. It was motivated, it's probably the only piece I've ever done where I was motivated because I was really angry. The summer before, my wife and I were out west. We toured Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado. Took our camper out for a month and just kind of tooled all over the place. It was that particular fall that uh, uh, President Trump was elected. And he decided after six months in office that he was going to take the uh, I, I think, what is it, Escalade Staircase? Is that what it's called out there? It's, yeah, Grand Staircase and Bears Ears Park, which Obama had given back to the natives uh, as a gesture from the government for them because it's full of natural 
native history. I mean, there's just pictographs, all kinds of stuff on it. Donald took that away and gave it to the energy world to go drill, make mines, find oil, whatever you wanted to do. I was furious because I've been through that land just six months before. It was beautiful and certainly not worthy of what uh, he gave it. And so I went out in my studio and grabbed a piece of wood and just started cranking dust. I was just really upset. And as I worked, it started taking a shape. I really didn't have a plan at all, but it started shaping out. And I said, okay, it's starting to look like a hawk. Oh, maybe I'll call a hawk, carve a hawk. And the more I carve, it just kind of designed itself. So this is called the grief of Gaia. Gaia being the methodical mother nature, uh, god of, of nature, you know. Um, the carving is supposedly representing kind of what nature looks like when it goes into a contract with man in, in his industry. The feather at the bottom is the only natural thing left, which is about percentage wise, when nature gets into a contract with man, that's about what's left, not much. So this is kind of my statement on political and uh, natural abuse on our natural lands in our natural places. I was thrilled to learn that uh, our current president gave the land back to the Indians. Uh, next, another shot on the other side, as you can see, is pretty well decayed on the other side, lots of holes, lots of uh, promises not kept. Next, and that's a close up. And this is all 100% wood. There's no metal involved. This is my superstar because in 2017, it garnished me the award of second best in the world at the world championships, which was a real surprise. Uh, but, you know, as they say, I'll take it. Next. Here's another solution to pictures in the back of carvings. This is a reverse shadow box again. This is a miniature uh, uh, great blue heron. This time, the poster behind it, I generated on my computer. I have a pen mouse and I have graphic tools and I started designing these backgrounds on the computer and had them printed out uh, with a printer that prints only in flat ink. So the colors have high intensity, no shine, no gloss. I wanted it to look like a serograph, which very few people do anymore. Uh, so it's really more what we call a digital serograph. Let's have the next picture. There's another one. Again, the uh, Black and white warblers are above the picture. They're not in it, they're, they're attached in front of it. And these are all popular park places down in the area where I live. And I did a show in June where I did 12 of these and it was very well received. In fact, I'm still filling orders. So it was a, it was a good move to make in terms of our business wise, but it was a lot of fun. And I like, I like how the detail of the bird and the lack of detail in the pictures, although they, they imply detail, they don't show it. Yet the two marry visually very well. I was very pleased with how that went together. If you could see the whole set, you would know what I'm talking about. It's just a real nice mix. And I'm really happy with that. And I'll be doing more stuff like this. It was a fun way to, to mix it up and to, again, expand the narrative on these carvings and give a little more story uh, than what the carvings by themselves can say. Next. Okay, that's a piece I did, and I just threw it in the in the blue spruce just to see what it looked like in the real environment. Just just horsed around. It was fun. Uh, next, and that's a that's a red pole that I did. Uh, you know, it's a, a northern Canadian bird that likes the cold weather. We see it in Ohio in the winter sometimes. I've not seen them too often. Um, it's a pretty little bird, and uh, again, everything there. I made. The only difference here is the branches are now welded. That's bronze that I weld because I can get real thin welds that way. And all the little uh, flowerings on the uh, on the winter goldenrod are made out of copper. And they're they're soldered in place. So I have learned over the years to get a little craftier about the habitat parts of it, which allows me to tell a better story sometimes. So I'm really happy that uh, I learned how to weld this stuff. It's, it's been a real uh, real saver in terms of e exploring different uh, options for work. So that's kind of a cross section of some of the things I've done. Certainly not all of them, but certainly some of them. Uh, I'm going to, for your information, walk you through 
the last project I did, go ahead. The corn shellers, next. This is a crow standing on an old agricultural box with some corn cobs and that rusty machine is called a corn sheller. You put the cob in that little tube-like thing and crank the handle and it strips all the corn off and ejects the cob. Uh, this is kind of a situation where the crow and the corn sheller are both interested in one thing, the corn. Next. So here's how it started. Um, I had a lot of pictures of the corn sheller, but really I had a lot of questions from the pictures, like what's behind this? How's this shape? What is this? How big is it? There's a lot of cases of scale I could not answer. So I got on eBay and found one, and they sent it to me, even with the old board attached to it. And that's, you can see it in the left-hand corner. The wooden one in, in the right corner is the reproduction that I made from the, the metal one that I can measure and, and match up. Next. So the next step, of course, is get the crow ready. We've got him cut out. You can see him, he's, he's being braced on the two boards that uh, are gonna compromise the uh, corner of the box. Next. So with the box put together, and now we have the uh, corn shelter in place, you can see the only thing metal on this thing is that copper coil in there, that's just ground wire. That's kind of a difficult thing to carve out of wood. And I used a couple of real bolts too, because I want to make sure the thing didn't like unglue or come apart. So there's actually a couple of bolts that hold that thing to the box. But other than that, it's pretty much all wood. Next. So this is uh, the process where I have the habitat put together. I have the handle, I've got the corn sheller. Now I want to put the bird on there and decide how I want to position him. You will see at the moment, he's in a downward position looking down into the box where eventually I settled on having him look up. And I'll discuss that later. Next, please. So in researching the boxes, when you look at these old agricultural boxes from the 30s and 40s, there's kind of an impression in the box. It's not just printed on there. It's kind of like stamped in there. So I realized I probably needed to carve the letter into the box uh, to get that effect. Next. The corn was a little more different. I uh, got hold of some real field corn. That's what, that's what, in the yellow, that's what that is. That's the real field corn. And of course, the things beside it are the, uh, the uh, chunks of Tupelo wood that I laid out to carve the corn cobs. This was the biggest surprise of the project. I looked at this, thought, well, this isn't too difficult. It's just that it went on forever. I was originally going to carve four ears of corn uh, next, I got two of them done, and I thought like three is enough. <laughs> you know, I just thought another one. I don't know if I could stand it. it. Just seemed like I was constantly carving and turning, and constantly curving and turning and turning. It, it never ended. It just kept going and going. It's like the carving; it wouldn't let you stop. I did. I did finally get them done. Uh, next, please. So. Now we're getting into the bird itself. You can see that there's a, 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 a study skin crow there. Uh, I get cooperation from uh, the Carnegie uh, Museum in Pittsburgh uh, for these. Uh, they help me answer particular questions of anatomy and detail and, and things you want to know. Of course, you can see I have lots of pictures on the wall uh, that'll help me uh, determine my layout. So uh, I used a marker on this particularly because uh, as I get older, I can't see the pencil lines as well. So I have to use a darker medium so they don't disappear on because sometimes the pencil lines rub off and I don't want to be lost in something like this. Next. So this shows the detail of the carving process. Um, because this is a blackbird um, and I'm really very interested in carving being more sculptural than model making, um, I tend to, on darker birds, I like to have a little bit of air or space or height between the feathers. So light and shadow is part of the participants of the whole presentation. So you can see that the feathers have the ruffles in it that we usually see. And of course, they're big feathers and there will be a little bit of air underneath a lot of these feathers when these birds, uh, you know, relax their wings. Next. So we use a burning pen to create the detail for all the different barbs inside the feather. Uh, and this kind of shows you 
you know, from one side, you see how she's carved in, and the other side shows you what happens when the burning pen goes to work. We actually burn in all the individual barbs in each of those feathers. Next. So you can see I've changed him. He's upright now. The reason I did that is because I actually liked him leaning into the box better, but at certain positions, because carvings are supposedly something you look at 360 degrees, uh, the back end was looking a little uninteresting because it was just his rump and tail. And then the front, the mo more interesting part of this carving is the open beak. And when he's leaning down, you don't see that. And I felt that was worth keeping an eye on. So I, 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 I braced him back up. Although I like the, the motion of the downwards swing, this was, in my mind, a better looking presentation. Next. So once the bird is completely textured, and, and the feathers are burned, everything's ready to go, it's time to paint. So he looks white, not because he's anemic, because that's called gesso. That's just a primer. I like white gesso because it seals the wood, but it also allows any color you put on to be true to what they're supposed to be. I know a lot of carvers that just use a clear coating for, for uh, sealing the wood. They don't necessarily gesso, but it means you got to put more paint on or you're forced to just airbrush it. So if you're a total airbrushing type of artist, it's not a problem, but I'm not. I use airbrush very minimally. I don't use it much at all. Uh, I like to hand paint. So the gesso in my mind keeps, keeps the color more accurate. Next. One of the paints I use, you can see that bottle in the background. I got it from Japan. Uh, it's a black paint that professes to only reflect 4% of the color to natural light. So in a sense, it's like painting a black hole. I didn't want to carve the throat of the bird too deep because uh, the way the, the, the angle goes, it would have caused me to probably chip or, or mark up the outside edges of the beak and I'd feel like doing that. So I found this paint and decided that I wouldn't have to go as deep, but I could paint the throat with that color and it would look like it was endless. And it actually does. Next. I also went into all the airy places that I pointed out and used that color as well. I didn't want any light to reflect out of underneath the wings, underneath the tail, anywhere the cracks between the feathers of color. I really wanted that to be very, 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 very black. Next. So well, this is the bird with a base coat on it. It's really not black at all. It's more of a dark brown. Uh, it's a color called sable, which I really like. I use it instead of black a lot. I only use black when I want to accent the uh, colors inside there. Because black is black, but everything else can look black, but not be black. And of course, we know the crow, he's got a pile of colors in there. When the sun hits him right, we've got turquoises and purples and blues and all kinds of fun stuff. And I really wanted to try and emulate that in this carving. I was really interested in doing that. Next. So that's a real crow feather next to the, the carving in its base color. We're not too far off, pretty close. Next. So the feet were made out of bronze and that's kind of the pieces parts for them. The center part is a brass tube that I cut very short and the toes were then braze welded onto that so that I could slip the toes through the leg of the bird and position them. My, my big challenge here was this bird is going to be standing on a corner. How were his toes going to bend? What direction were the toes going to go? So I really had to kind of come up with a system where I could play with that a little bit before I decided on how things would be bent. And with bronze, a nice thing about that is you can heat it up to a point where it doesn't melt, but it will bend real easy. So I was able to take the toes and and heat it up and bend it up just where I wanted it and stop and it would cool off and be there rather than trying to bend it with pliers because this is eighth inch round uh, bronze and it can be even though it's a soft metal that can still be pretty pretty demanding to try and bend with some pliers or tools next picture so you can see here that the toes are brazed onto the brass tube and of course then the legs are um, are solid brass legs and you can see how they're positioned and I've already gone about deciding how I'm going to bend the toes and where they're going to be and how they're going to point and I can go ahead and solder those on in place. Next. 
So in the painting process, I think you can see some of the blues and reds and other hues in the crow that are coming through in this photograph. Uh, you also notice that the crow feathers under certain reflections, all the feathers have a black outline to them. So I was busy trying to put that on there as well. Next. In the painting process, you'll see a paper there by the uh, by the uh, study cast or the study uh, study bird. Uh, I took black, I took sable, and I took some other colors and painted on this card. And then I proceeded to play with a lot of different fluorescent colors, iridescent colors, pearlescent colors, uh, uh, interference colors, all kinds of stuff. Did some sampling to try and find some answers to which which of these mixtures of paints will give me the iridescent quality that I'm looking for in this carving. Um, next. This is the surprise of the day. Now that is a color shift with a iridescent finish and it's red. But I found out that when I squeeze it on a brush and literally brush almost 98% of the paint off the brush, what's left behind is a slight fluorescent or iridescent kind of gel that goes on and it looks blue. It wasn't red at all. It was very bluish. And it was the right shade of blue for the crow. Because one of the problems we have with trying to emulate birds of iridescence quality is that the paint is usually more powerful than the iridescence is. And it tends to make them look a little fake. So I was really trying not to do that. I really wanted that finish to be pretty close to the real bird. Next. And that's kind of the finish there. You can see the blue haze all through that bird. That's that red paint. Isn't that wild? <laughs> I was really surprised. Next. So that's the underside. I will say that this bird was textured many different ways because I do believe that when we carve birds, how we texture them has a lot to do with how we paint them. So like on the top of the head and the back, the, the, the texture was very tight, very smooth oriented on the belly. That's where the bird's feathers are a little rougher. I textured that slightly different. Uh, all through the bird, there's different sections where the texturing was either burned tight or burned wide, or or uh, or we carved the texture in very very deeply or very very softly, depending on what I wanted. Next, so here you can see a picture of his throat. It looks like it's going way down there, but it's not. That's that wonderful paint that doesn't reflect. I was able to put the uh, color inside the bill to a certain point and get only what I want to reflect on top. Next. Came time to paint the uh, rusty stuff. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm well known in the carving bird world as being the best rust maker you ever saw. They always see that stuff, ah, I knew that was yours. You always do the best rust. So again, I'm using gesso to uh, make the piece white because I want my colors to be retained very well. Uh, I'm also, uh, the, the little nails on there are actually dowel rods that I pointed and there's a little bit of gaps. So I'm using some Liquitex modeling paste to fill the gaps in so that we don't have that one look more welted than just stuck in there. Next. So here's painting of the corn. That was far easier than carving. Uh, as you can say, it's not very difficult. They're very yellow, thankfully. Uh, so there's the three ears I've carved. Next, one of those ears is real. The other three are the final carvings. So I was pretty pleased uh, that I came off with what I think is a real convincing pile of corn. <laughs> so maybe I'll be known for that now too. I don't know, but uh, next please. So now I'm applying the color to the uh, farm equipment, which, you know, of course, I want that to be a very rusty color. I don't know what it is. When I first saw that kestrel in, in the Amish country on that rusty farm equipment, I've just really been, I've done several pieces where I'm using rust or rusty machines with the, with the birds. I just like the, the mixture of the texture, the colors, the, I don't know, it just, and I, I'll tell you, the other part of it is how birds manage to get along with man's junk. I mean, if you really watch, you find out they make wonderful homes out of holes in the walls and electrical equipment and rusty old 
equipment laying around or broken fences or whatever. They just find a way to make it work. So I've been really fascinated how birds, you know, continue in spite of this stu stupid stuff we lay around and leave behind. Next. So this is a detail of the foot. Uh, once the bronze is uh, uh, put in position and it's welded, uh, we use a two-part poxy putty that's uh, it's yellow and blue. When you mix it, it turns green. And it stays pliable for about two hours. And it's real finite. I can go in there with tiny little uh, metal tools to create the scaling on the foot, uh, all that stuff. Um, and, it's, and it's basically when you're done, it's green. You don't see that here per se. Uh, but this is where I'm painting the scaling in. Uh, I'm able to take small brushes and actually where it's white uh, to go in there and actually outline some of that scaling uh, to get that the way we want it uh, against the black foot. It's just not enough to call, paint it black. You got to put that scaling in and bring it forward. Next. So this is all the corn shiller parts that have been painted and are rustified. So there they lay, waiting for their, their final destination. Next. So now it's time for the box. As I mentioned before, I had to carve the lettering into the box because I felt that a lot of those boxes were stamped somehow, maybe printed and stamped at the same time. I'm really not familiar. Uh, so I had to paint the lettering in after I carved it. Next. And now I'm painting the actual box itself and forcing color and age. And uh, you can see I'm using some of my better equipment. These are brushes that have bad hair days from here to next week. I've had them for years. They're terrible, but they do great boxes. <laughs> and uh, they're wonderful for getting rough strokes and slapping color around a little bit. Uh, I, I keep all of them because they, they come in handy. Next. So there's our shiller put together. It is attached to the one part of the box, as you can see. This was a chance for me to look at the coloration. I didn't want the box to be too much the same color as the Schiller, because we need a little bit of variety here. You can see in the background, there's some, some pictures that I grabbed off the internet of some of these old, old, old crates and stuff that business used to use back, back when. Next. So this is the finish. This is the kind of the side back side of the crow against the corn shiller. You can see the opening there where the corn goes, the handle, everything there. It is uh, mostly wood. As you know, there's a coil that's metal and the legs are metal. Everything else has been carved or created out of wood. And this is my COVID project. When COVID came along, all the competitions, art shows, gallery shows, everything closed. Nothing was open. And so I thought, you know, there was two things that was nagging it. One was I did a crow years back and I wasn't happy with the paint. So I wanted to do a crow where I could try and replicate or emulate the real reflective values in, in the bird's feathers. So I wanted to do a crow and then I had to figure out what I was gonna do it with. And so, you know, the idea just formed itself. Um, and I also wanted a project where most of the work required was wood carving, you know, like, the, the, the red pole I showed you earlier, the bird is very small, but everything else is metal. I was really trying to get away from that for a change. I really wanted to get into just a total wood carving experience, if you will, which is why this thing is what it is. Um, and it took me almost off and on two years to finish it. And I'm real happy with it. Uh, it's not a favorite at the competitions because I use styles that most people don't appreciate or don't like but that's okay. I'm an artist. I do what I like. So that's okay with me. Uh, anyway, that is um, the corn sheller presentation. And I'm now available to answer questions. <laughs> yes. Before you went to uh, Shingatika, uh, what kind of artist were you? Oh, <laughs> well, let's see. I did four years as a political cartoonist for a small weekly paper, and they gave me free reign. Let me tell you, I went wild. Uh, I loved it. Uh, cartooning is my other artistic passion. That's what I wanted to do since I was a kid. Uh, 
I did, you know, I was in the sign business. My dad taught me how to do sign work when I was a teenager. He used to do it on the side to make money so he could buy movie equipment because he liked to dabble in motion pictures and it's an expensive hobby. So we would let her trucks, we would let her soapbox derbies, we, you know, whatever. And um, I was the oldest son, so I got to help him and I learned from him how to do that. So I had my own sign business for you know, 30 some, 35 years, uh, specializing mostly in wooden type signs. I didn't get into the electronic and neon stuff. I didn't care for that, but I did a lot of vehicle lettering, did the pinstriping, that scrolly stuff. I did etch glass. I did the gold leaf on glass, all these lost arts because it's all peel and stick now. But, you know, I knew how to do all that stuff by hand in the, in, at the time. I, even the lettering was done with a paintbrush when I first started. Now it's all peel and stick. But uh, yeah, it was great. And I did, I did, uh, I, I also hired out and did pencil portraits of people's kids. I did uh, caricatures. I did uh, watercolors. I did, I, I, I've done just about everything you can think of, really. Uh, you know, my last real job was a product designer for a company that did home decor items. And I worked there for eight years designing, you know, live, laugh, love signs and old posters of antique equipment and whatever, just stuff people hang in their houses, you know, that kind of thing. It was all pretty much designed on a computer and sent to China. And they'd make eight zillion of them and send them over in a crate and we'd sell them. But uh, uh, that was kind of the opposite. Everybody says, oh, China ruined the, the business world. Well, in this case, this company needed China to have a product line because there was no way we could afford to, to build them here. It was too expensive. So it, was, it was weird. I got to go to China for a month. So that was really cool. Got to work with some of our manufacturers over there. So that was interesting. So anyway, the, the yacht gam is kind of buried. That's why the epiphany was so important. It's, it's no different than a kid learns how to play trumpet forever. And then suddenly he decides, I want to be in an orchestra. I want to play classical music or I want to play jazz or whatever. Uh, so all these great musicians we know or actors, you know, they all had their epiphany of their own, really, in discovering what medium or what channel of medium they really like. And the bird carving really, and still does, appeals to me. Lovely. Uh, uh, yes. Hi, you mentioned something about um, you're filling orders. So yes. are you doing like reproductions of work that you've already done for somebody? I like that. Can you make me another one? Yes. If you like, for instance, what I do is although the posters can be reprinted, the birds are original every time. So I already had uh, someone asked about the hair and I wanted uh, someone bought that one. And I had to make another one. I just changed the whole position of the bird. That one, his head's down. The other one, his head's very much up. I'm working on right now where his head's really tucked into the body. Uh, so I can change that, or I can even change the bird. I told him, I said, if you don't want a heron, I'll give you something else. You want a green heron? You want a goldfinch? Whatever, you know. The posters exist as they are as a, as a destination. In other words, the whole idea came from the fact that not a lot of people's birding experiences, not so much this group, because you guys are out there actively involved with bird watching, but the average person usually gets their bird experiences out of what? Our natural parks. So that's what led me to go that route. I looked at the old WPA posters from the 30s as kind of a guidance for how I might set up the design for the detail and then just start working that through. So the bird on the outside, um, you know, I may have used a, a blue heron on the, on, the, on the heron rookery, but I could have used something else doesn't matter. There's a lot of red winged blackbirds down there too. So uh, whatever people want. So to answer your question is I do reproduce the poster, but the bird is pretty much what the customer wants. So how do you start the carving in the block of wood? And then how do you proceed with different tools or whatever? Okay. Um, up here, if you look after the talk, you can come look at some of these tools. Uh, I'm going to show you right here. This is a pattern. Now, I, I teach this uh, at the Cuyahoga Valley Art Center. It's a class for beginning decorative bird carving. And this is typically what I'll hand to my students the first night. So you got a profile, you got a top view, an under view, and even a front view here. In our measurements, we do everything in millimeters because it's a small bird. Uh, so. You can, you can imagine you get a block of wood that's about the size of this for the side profile. 
and it has to be the same or you know it has to have enough wood to do the top profile if you take the top profile and outline it on the block and the side profile then on the side you put the bandsaw you cut the top first cut the side second all the wood falls away and inside you have this piece of wood that's kind of squarely cut but it resembles that shape and that's what we start with we really don't start with a block per se uh, that's that's hard going. You got to really get rid of a lot of wood you don't want. So the bandsaw process gets it, it gets that block into a basic shape. We call that a blank. And you know, to look at it, it could be just about any bird. In fact, I have taken blanks that were for chickadees, and made goldfinches out of them, or made warblers out of them because there's enough wood there I can do whatever I want with it. So uh, it's just a basic shape. Does that answer your question? Oh, tools. Okay, yes. Uh, we, I'm what they call a power carver. So all the pieces you saw in this presentation are made out of wood called tupelo. Tupelo grows down in the southern parts of the country in the swamps, uh, you know, so it's not just uh, harvested pretty recklessly. It has to be harvested carefully. Uh, the wood is, um, the grain is so tight on it, it's almost like a composite. You can hardly see the grain on it half the time, which means when we do etchings onto the feathers and scratches and the burnings and so forth, we get tremendous detail. You can see that when you come up here, you can actually see just how receiving the wood is and how, how giving it is allow us to get all the detail that we can. And it's a wonderful wood. A, a popular wood beside that is basswood or linwood tree. That's another one that a lot of people like to use, but that's more of a carving wood for like chisels and, and knives and such. I have found Tupelo to be not as agreeable for that, but it's a great, what we call power carving. So the tools I use are micro motors or like miniature Dremels. There's a tool called a forum, which is like a bigger type of Dremel. These are all rotary electrical motorized equipment that makes tremendous fine dust that goes everywhere. So, you know, if the knives just create chips, these things create dust like you can't believe, but uh, as Nancy can attest to, because she's done a few of these in class, it's a great way to do it. And it's pretty safe, actually. You think rotorized equipment, and everything, ah, but I, I used to teach carving years ago when we used basswood and we we're doing ducks. And, and, you know, I call it the Bloody Tuesday because people were putting gouges and chisels and stuff through their hands, blood spurting everywhere. My first aid kit was worn out the first month. Uh, but I think in the eight years I've been teaching the beginning classes down at Chicago Valley Art Center, we've only had one case where somebody let the tool uh, brush on their finger and I had to get them a Band-Aid. And that was the end of that. I mean, it was, it was not severe. So power carving is really a nice way to do things, but you do have to mask up. You do have to collect your dust and keep clean. And uh, there's a lot of that cleanup afterwards. But uh, as you can see, these are all power carved. Uh, it does a wonderful job. All right. In the essence of time, uh, again, we want to give Tom, first of all, a nice round of applause again. And please step up to the table, take a look, ask questions, yeah. uh, pick up the literature there. Again, take a look at the literature at the back table. And we thank you so much for your time. This is this has been terrific. Oh, so thank you. I, I hope a lot of you sign up for classes or at least buy something. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. So please enjoy, please chat a little bit. Yeah. Thank you all very much.